Well, this is our second session on the theology of evangelism in our study uh, through the scriptures and a broad overview, as it were, of what the scripture says about the good news of Jesus Christ, the need uh, for salvation, and uh, what we can learn about God as well as ourselves as we think about God's efforts to uh, redeem, restore uh, people to a relationship with Him. In our first uh, session, we uh, uh, tried to encourage us to think theologically, which means to have an overview of all of Scripture. What is all of Scripture saying? What are the major themes that continue to come up in the Bible? Uh, what is the, the main storyline, even though the books are different, whether it's the historical books in the Old Testament, the poetic books, the books of prophecy, or the Gospels and the epistles in the New Testament? What are the major big ideas? What is God really attempting to do? And uh, there are two verses that we studied last time in chapter 3 of Genesis that point to God's uh, efforts and plan to redeem, restore a rebellious mankind to a relationship with Him. And one is in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 15. And the scripture says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Well, first of all, this is... Uh, uh, obviously a verse of conflict, and uh, it emphasizes uh, the second part of the verse that the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent who was the one that tempted, that uh, inside induced uh, Adam and Eve to uh, disobey God and to, to rather follow themselves as he had followed himself. But there is this promise uh, of a future destruction of this evil one, and it's through the seed of the woman. And uh, we theologically uh, believe that that is the first picture of a Messiah coming to deliver mankind from sin and death. And then in the latter part of chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Uh, again, this is a response to their rebellion, to their going their own way, to their disregard of God's uh, command to not eat from the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And um, the need that Adam and Eve had was some covering of their sense of guilt and shame, which was true. They were guilty. They were shameful. They had lost uh, that innocence and that transparency with God. And so God provided a covering, and this covering, it says, was a, a garment of skin, uh, obviously of an animal that had to die, give uh, their skin as clothing for Adam and Eve. And again, here we have the introduction of an act of God on behalf of man that involves the death of of an animal, the shedding of blood, but also provides in, in that giving of a life, it provided a covering uh, uh, for Adam and Eve, for their sin, uh, their guilt, and their shame. So these are just seed ideas, beginning ideas that uh, we're going to see uh, throughout the rest of Scripture, but uh, we would say, I would say, I think the scripture is saying, this is good news <laughs> in spite of the rebellion, in spite of Adam and Eve uh, disregarding God and thinking only of themselves, in a sense, worshiping themselves, putting themselves at the center of life and not God and not their relationship with God. And also, these uh, verses speak of restoration, restoring to a relationship with God. And in uh, the historical books then, that is Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, these are the beginning ideas that are introduced there. And um, in Genesis chapter 6 uh, and following the story of Noah, which uh, we touched on a little bit 
in our last lecture, uh, but the story of Noah emphasizes uh, the, the, really the spread of evil. As, as humanity grows and multiplies in number, then we see the same with the magnitude of sin. It gets worse and worse and worse uh, to the point that uh, this rapid progress of sin uh, brings God to this conclusion in, in uh, Genesis chapter 6, uh, verses 5 to 8. And let me read them. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so here, uh, in spite of the immense and, and uh, uh, extensive spread of sin and evil, there is one person, Noah, uh, that finds favor with God, that seems to have a heart for God, seems to want to, to please God and follow God. So um, God uh, works with uh, Noah and uh, asks him to build this ark uh, through which the ark uh, and was uh, Noah's family was preserved in the judgment of the flood. And uh, in chapter 8, in verse 20, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I, uh, will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures that I have um, I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So here uh, there is uh, worship. There's worship of God after the flood, the worship of God, the acknowledgement of um, God's uh, sovereignty and his due worship. He is the creator, the Lord. And uh, then the promise. So from worship and response, God's promise uh, not to destroy uh, uh, mankind again. And uh, a sign of that, we know, was the rainbow. And uh, chapter 9, verse 9, I now establish my covenant with, covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you. And so uh, by... Uh, obedience of Noah, uh, the grace of God given to Noah, there is a, a deliverer. Noah and his family are saved in, as they obey God and follow him, and uh, the covenant is established because of their obedience for all humanity that destruction by water would never come again. So Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, in the eyes of uh, Yahweh God, and again, a picture of God's salvation, God's deliverance uh, for uh, uh, Noah. Then in chapter 12 of Genesis, and uh, the last passage that we'll look in terms of the historical books, is again the extension of this idea of covenant of promise of God the Savior, God th that is going to redeem mankind. And we have a new character named Abram. And the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. And so here, again, we have God initiating, as he found favor with Noah, he now finds Abram and chooses Abram, speaks to Abraham, and uh, 
uh, on, uh, again, we see something about salvation. God is the initiator. God is the one with the plan, with uh, initiating the relationship, engaging with the person. And um, the <clears throat> beautiful thing about this particular promise, there are many, but it's the concept that all the peoples on the earth are going to be blessed through Abraham. Uh, not just Abraham, not just at that point his the, the nation that would come through him, but all peoples uh, of the earth, all nations. Uh, they're going to be made into a great nation, but all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. <clears throat> and I think this is a major uh, revelation, a major idea, that even though God begins with Abram, and uh, again, his name is eventually changed to Abraham, father of uh, many nations, uh, many peoples. Uh, uh, the intention from the very beginning of God is that all peoples uh, will be blessed, all the peoples on the earth, uh, not, not just Abraham, not just one individual or one nation, even though the Jewish nation obviously came uh, from from Abraham. And so the, the concept of covenant, of God's promise, uh, God initiating, God uh, showing himself as a, a loving God, a God that is attempting to restore the relationship that was lost in the garden is uh, the, the revelation of the Bible in the broad sense. And then... Um, and the, the final kind of historic book we want to look at is Exodus. Uh, and the, the story of, of God um, um, freeing uh, uh, Israel from Egypt. So in Genesis, uh, very quickly we had that snapshot of God making a covenant with an individual, choosing from one land, sending him to another. And of course, Abraham, the man of faith, he he believed God. He acted on what God asked him to do. And uh, that initiated the relationship with God and a lifetime of God blessing and providing for Abraham as he obeyed God. And out of that, obviously, uh, uh, came a nation uh, through Abraham and the seed of Abraham. And then, uh, because of their... Uh, condition and disobedience, they ended up to be slaves in Egypt. Uh, and um, in Exodus uh, chapter 2, uh, chapter 3, verses 12, uh, chapter 12 to 15, uh, we have uh, the story of God's deliverance, God's redeeming, taking uh, Israel out of Egypt. And uh, we know that uh, they're oppressed, uh, they're captives, uh, they're the slaves in, in Egypt. Um, but then in uh, chapter 2 of Exodus, uh, God uh, has the story of Moses. Uh, now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. And in this, we know the story of Moses being hidden, being uh, discovered uh, by uh, Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, then uh, uh, his sister, Moses' sister, brings Moses' mother to um, the uh, princess of Egypt, and uh, uh, she becomes the caretaker for her very son and uh, raises him. And uh, But the point of Moses is that um, God is going to deliver them. And in verse 23 of chapter 2, it says, During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard them groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So again, we have here the, in this, really the story of God, God's care, God's concern, God's hearing, God's seeing that the children of Israel were in, in deep trouble and pain and slavery 
and God wanting to do something. And uh, just as in Genesis 3, God provides, God promised, God provided. Here we see, again, God looking on, seeing the condition of the Israelites in slavery. So uh, part of this theology of evangelism is understanding who God is. What is God like? How does God act in relationship to us? And here we find in these verses at the end of chapter 3, a God who's very empathetic, very aware of the condition of mankind, and uh, he's concerned about them that he himself, that is God himself, moves uh, to action. And so um, he moves to action through people. And in this case, we know it's Moses. So at beginning chapter 3, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of the fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. So here in chapter 3, God um, gets the attention of Moses, uh, the man that he is going to use as the leader of the Exodus. And he gets his attention through a fire. Obviously, this bush is on fire, but the bush is not consumed. The bush continues to be the bush, and the fire continues to be the fire. And, um, and God notices that Moses came over, and he's looking at the bush. And he calls out, God calls out from the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses responded, here I am. So again, here we have God initiating a relationship, getting Moses' attention, uh, uh, capturing his attention in this uh, unique experience of the bush that's not consumed and uh, speaking to him, uh, speaking his name, and Moses responding, here I am. And um, so um, God is engaging. God is choosing a person. Uh, and in this case, the person is Moses. And in verse 7, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptian and to bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way of the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So the first major thing I'm emphasizing, I think, the scriptures is, what is God like? He's, he's a concerned God. He's a God observing the condition of humanity. Second, he chooses a person uh, uh, to be a deliverer. He, he takes one of the the, the persons of humanity, and he is sending him. I'm sending you. Go. Uh, I, I'm going to use you to be a deliverer for the children of Israel. And uh, in uh, chapter 3, then uh, uh, ends with this uh, um, tremendous truth about those who are sent. And... Uh, you know, Moses is timid or shy or uh, lacking confidence. Uh, and um, we might say, or on the other side, we might say he underst understands the magnitude of what God is asking him to do. And um, he requests of God, I, I can't do this alone. I'm not adequate in and of myself. And so the text goes on. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. 
you will worship God on this mountain. And interesting, the sign comes after his obedience and seeing what God wants him to do. And Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? So here, um, you know, Moses, who is noted as meek or timid in some ways, um, he, he is also very intelligent to understand. He goes, he's in a sense unknown, even though he was uh, there 40 years before. Um, why would the Israelites follow him? Why would the Israelites believe what he has to say? So he's requesting of God uh, to know God better, uh, to, in a sense, to know God more personally and, and, and strengthen his confidence in the God who is sending him. So God said to Moses, uh, in terms of what is his name, God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. So in choosing Moses, we have a pattern of uh, God's deliverance. He chooses a person, he sends the person. The person Moses, uh, uh, listening to God, responding to God, I think looks at his own sense of inadequacy and requests of God, please reveal to me your name. I need to know you more. I need to have confidence and authority. Who is sending me to the, to the Israelites to deliver them? And so... Um, God does, uh, in, in these uh, few verses, reveal to him the very essence of his character, of who he is, who is God. Um, and he says, I am who I am, which I think we could interpret in this way, that, that he is self-existing. <laughs> Uh, he, he, God doesn't need any external props or relationships or resources or knowledge. He, he exists in and of himself. He is eternal. Uh, I, I am the eternal one. As uh, Jesus said, uh, really at the end of uh, scriptures in Revelation, I am the living one. As uh, Peter preached uh, in, in Acts 3, he says that Jesus himself is the author of life. Uh, as the Bible began, in the beginning, God. Uh, God is self-existing. He is the source of all things, the originator of all things. He doesn't need food, water, atmosphere. Uh, he himself is life, and life comes from God. He is the eternal one. And uh, then, in, that's in verse 14, uh, and, and then in verse 15, God also to, said to Moses, say to the Israelites, Yahweh, or Jehovah, uh, the God of your fathers. So he, he moves in, in the Hebrew language from the, f the first person, I am who I am, to the third person, which really Yahweh means he is. He is what you need. He is available. He is present. He is here. And so uh, the term Yahweh uh, becomes God's personal name, just as my name is Tim or Timothy. And we all have a personal name that d d identifies us, uh, describes us, and people will come to know us by that name. Uh, Yahweh or Jehovah is the personal name of God. Uh, and we come to see that uh, uh, Jesus, Yahweh saves, is the meaning of Jesus. So that name is carried over even into the New Testament. But it is a very precious and, and vital understanding of God. 
that God is personal. He is a person. He is a being. He is eternal. He is self-existing. And for Moses, the point was, I will be with you. And uh, I will be what you need, when you need it. I will be the resource of your life. And so uh, Yahweh then is, uh, in chapter 3 of uh, Exodus, is a tremendous un we an understanding and that, that we need to have about the God who saves. The God who saves is the eternal one, the, the, the creator, the originator. Uh, and and as, even as it says in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the sustainer of all. And uh, so... <laughs> Moses uh, is certainly informed here of something very special and unique. And um, it, it, to me, the foundation of salvation, the foundation of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, is you have to have someone, put it this way simply, big enough to solve the problem of sin and death big enough to solve the problem of the issue of man being separated, alienated from God. And in this God who is eternal, but also in the revelation of his name Yahweh, he becomes present because the I, eternal I am is the present. He is what we need. He is the resource. He is present with us. And so Moses uh, is chosen and Moses is sent. And uh, in chapter 12 to 14 of Exodus uh, is the description of that uh, deliverance. But then we come to chapter 15. And uh, for purposes of uh, our time and, and our lecture, I think chapter 15 of Exodus is a great summary of salvation. It is the song of Moses and Miriam. Uh, and in this celebration... Again, we, we learn about the, uh, the, the joy, the, the, uh, the outcome of salvation, that God delivers uh, the children of Israel, obviously through the plagues and through the confrontation with Pharaoh, through the, the miraculous parting of the Red Sea and uh, their obedience to follow and the destruction of the Egyptians but God taking them through uh, the Red Sea and out of Egypt. And in, in uh, Gen uh, Exodus 15, uh, it says, uh, it reads in this way, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord. Okay, and this is Yahweh. Uh, it's capitalized. It's, it's all in, in our English. It's all in capital letters, usually in bold in many of the English translations. And again, that's emphasizing God's personal name, not the attributes of God or the might of God or the, the presence of God, but who he is. He is the self-existing, eternal God who makes himself present to us. And so his name is very important. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the, to the Lord, to Yahweh. I will sing to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver, he is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Verse 2, he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Uh, so the, the psalm, uh, song, really, of, of deliverance, the song of Moses and Miriam, is a song of salvation. And again, it's describing the work of God, this God who is eternal, who is ever-present for those who believe uh, in him. He is the one who delivers them uh, and uh, th through very difficult situation. But he is a deliverer, and he, and he brings salvation to him. And therefore, we are to praise him, to worship him, to exalt his name. Uh, he goes on to say in verse 3, The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army has hurled into the sea. The 
Best of Pharaoh's officers have drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, has majestic, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. So in, in verse 6, we see that it, it emphasizes the power of God. The power of God. Um, um, and that his, his, his right hand uh, is, is obviously a symbol of power and strength. And that he com- conquers enemy, enemies. Verse 7, in the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. And then in verse 11, who among the gods is like Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? So in Exodus 15, we have this tremendous uh, song of worship, of praise, but it's also a song, a song revealing more of who God is. And that, uh, in, as it says in verse 11, he is uh, uh, uncomparable. There, there is no God like Yahweh. There is no God who is a savior. There is no God who is powerful. There's no God who compares at all in his majesty. And this is a God that is the God who saves, who redeems, who delivers Israel out of captivity to the Egyptians after 400 years. And this is a God who is to be worshipped and praised. Moving from uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books, and particularly looking at Exodus, to uh, some wisdom literature and the sense of uh, looking at Job and uh, kind of including Job in the historical books because he's probably the first uh, book we have in Scripture, the oldest book, even preceding uh, Genesis, is the life of Job. And uh, Job, we know his story of uh, being a successful man, a God-honoring man, but being being tested and losing and going through tremendous suffering of loss of uh, children and loss of wealth and loss of health. But in this story, we see a tremendous story of a man of faith and trust in God. And... uh, Job uh, says some of the most enlightening things about the God who saves, uh, the God who is a a redeeming God. He understands that and communicates that uh, in the story that's written about his life. And in Job chapter 19, verse 23 to 27, it reads in this way, and Job is speaking, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in a rock forever. And this is what he says, those that he wants to be in the rock forever. Verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Uh, Job believes in a redeemer, (laughs) Uh, a God who restores, a God also who is is present and that will be seen. It will be seen by his own eyes, not the eyes of someone else. It will be seen by Job even though he, he admits His flesh will decay and rot, yet again in a body or in my flesh, implying another, a resurrection as I take it, uh, that he will see God with his own eyes. It's not someone else. He's not someone else. God is not another God. It's the true God. It's the Redeemer God that he believes in and that it will be upon the earth. And uh, this is the yearning or the passion uh, uh, the motivation, it seems very clearly, of his heart, of a faith that he believes in God. And again, this is the person 
that when Satan came to God, God said, do you know about my servant Job? That God was, uh, shall we say, I think, impressed with Job. That Job was going to believe in God, no, no, matter, no matter if God had taken everything away. And, and he had allowed Satan to do that. But we know in the end uh, that these things, uh, people, relationships, uh, wealth were restored to Job. But what a man of faith. But his picture of God is a God who redeems, a God who is personal, a God who is present with him. And so as we look at the broad strokes of, of Scripture, the themes uh, I, I believe th these are the patterns that we see. We see it with Adam and Eve. We see it with Noah. We see it with Abraham. We see it here with Job, uh, the man of faith. And uh, to conclude uh, some of our pictures of the Old Testament, I want to go to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, we know, are post-exilic, after the exile, uh, after you know, the exodus, the whole history of Israel, the exile now returning. And we know Ezra is a priest. Uh, we know uh, that he knew the word of God very well. Um, and uh, he's obviously a contemporary with Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is more of a leader, civic leader, and his story. Uh, on the one hand, Ezra's story is about the word, about uh, spiritual revival, about obedience to the Word of God, understanding the Word of God, believing in God. And Nehemiah is obviously a godly man. And in Nehemiah chapter 1, when Nehemiah's brother returns to give a report, what is happening in the promised land in Israel, in Judea, in the days in which they live. And uh, he said, those who, uh, his brother said to me, those who surround the exiles are back in the province are in great trouble and dis disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now that's a report about the city. But in Ezra, in Ezra chapter 6, and if you read verses 13 to 18, you'll see that the elders and those who had returned, some of the early exiles that uh, it says in verse uh, 14 of Ezra 6, so the elders of the Jews continue to build and pros, uh, under the preaching of Haggai, prophet, and Zechariah. They finish building the temple according to the command of God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus. So in Israel, the, the temple had been restored by the earliest uh, returning exiles, but uh, the city itself was not rebuilt. And the gates of the city is always a, a picture of uh, the strength and the prosperity of a city, of a people, of a civilization. And though there was a place to worship God, the temple had been restored and they were worshiping God, Yahweh, uh, the Jewish people, the city of Jerusalem was still in ruins. And when I heard this, uh, Nehemiah says, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Um, and so uh, as I think of what God desires for Israel in the Old Testament, who God is, how God works, what God's intention is, certainly is the worship of God. The temple was rebuilt under Ezra. The city, however, was still in ruins. And it was not functioning. It was not a thriving civilization. And I think of our own world today in which we live. Uh, there are many healthy churches. There are many beautiful churches, wonderful communities of faith. But our civilization is deteriorating around us. We, I live in Portland, Oregon, and we're one of the classic examples today of, of a godless city, of a, a city center where the largest buildings and the pride of the city is, is basically overrun by homeless people and being abandoned. Many, many businesses have been abandoned and uh, buildings uh, are, are vacant and churches that are there are, are struggling to exist in the heart of our city. Uh, and to me, it's a picture of people living without God. People, I mean, it's not just a picture. They are, they're rebellious, they're godless, they're lawless in our day and age. 
And in the days of uh, the rebuilding of Jerusalem after the exile, we, we have the, the, the same uh, picture in one sense. There is the worship of God by some, but the city itself in its civil functions of uh, commerce and trade and government and education and uh, you, you might say culture uh, is, is still in ruins. And so Nehemiah uh, said in his prayer, Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night and for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins our Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, even then, uh, I, uh, e then even if your exiled people are at a far farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed. By your great strength and mighty hand, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayers of this your servant, the prayer of your servants who deliver delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor and the presence of this man, which was the king. So uh, God is a God of redemption. Uh, God is uh, desiring to bring people back to himself and to bring full salvation, and we'll see this later. Salvation not just in a personal, we say, spiritual life, the worship of God. Ezra, they rebuilt the temple, they worshiped God. The city was in ruins. God doesn't want a city in ruins. He doesn't want our life in ruins. He wants us to be fully redeemed, fully saved. And this uh, was the mission of Nehemiah. And they did rebuild the balls. And the city did begin to thrive. But another key element of evangelism, it began by the people of God, Nehemiah, representing them, confessing their sins, making sure they were right with God, seeking God's forgiveness, God's healing, God's power. And this is what Nehemiah learned about God. But you are a forgiving God, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, uh, verse uh, uh, 17. Uh, what kind of God saves? A loving, forgiving uh, God who provides forgiveness, uh, restoration, and fullness of life. These are some of the uh, key uh, principles that we see in Scripture and in the Old Testament about the God who is a God who saves. As we continue in Nehemiah uh, to consider um, a theology of evangelism, um, I'm reading the scriptures to look for those elements, uh, truths, principles that uh, we consistently see about who God is, how he redeems people, what is the condition of the people he is redeeming so that uh, we, we really see the, the fingerprints of God throughout Scripture and how he deals with, uh, with us humans, how he brings salvation to us in any particular period of time. What is God like? What are the people doing? How do they respond to him? So as uh, so we began with uh, Nehemiah and also reflect on Ezra because they're contemporary, we see that in the exile, as they got to return from Babylon, uh, a temple was rebuilt, but the city was not. And it's always impressed me about the story of Nehemiah, that uh, Nehemiah's heart was broken about the, the reality that the city was not functioning as a real city should, as a place where people could live, could thrive, uh, could enjoy life, could be a blessing to others, could find 
security in the fact that their, their lives were centered around the worship of God, but their lives became productive. Uh, their lives became, as it were, evidence of redemption, uh, that, that, that they prospered in that city. Even the city gates, we know in the Old Testament, is a picture of civil government because that's where the judges of the city sat in uh, the, the casemate walls around the city and the gates of the city were not just one gate, but uh, there were several uh, enclaves in those gates where people sat, and that's where the judges of the city sat. That's where commerce was made, where civil government, where the governing people dealt with the citizens uh, of their day. And those things were destroyed, and that's what brought, brought Nehemiah's heart. Of course, he is a civil servant in Babylon. He is one knowing what power can do, positively or negatively, for the daily lives of people. And so uh, as we look at Nehemiah, we, we, we see that there is a God who is loving and redemptive. Uh, what are some of the uh, experience of rebuilding that wall that, that uh, may teach us about this whole uh, concept of salvation, of God's goodness, God's good news coming to people? Well, for one thing, there's opposition by uh, the citizens that live there at the time. Uh, not the Jewish people, the other people. We know Sanballat and Tobiah and others resisted uh, the efforts of rebuilding the city. And, you know, for us, to me, that, you know, suggests, and we know throughout Scripture, there is opposition to the things of God. There's opposition from our, our own fallen nature, there's opposition from evil people, people who don't believe in God, people who oppose the things of God. And so uh, we, we see this in Nehemiah. And uh, how did they respond to that uh, opposition? It says in chapter 4, verse 9, But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. So in, in terms of evangelism or in terms of the good news of God's gospel, coming to any people, there is opposition. There is opposition uh, of our own fleshly nature. There is uh, opposition of uh, the spiritual opposition from Satan and uh, spiritual warfare. There's opposition from those people who disagree, who are, are atheists, who don't believe in God. And so here the principle, again, is but we prayed. And so one of the great weapons uh, one of the great offensive tools of evangelism is prayer. And we see that even in this day in the challenges that Nehemiah faced in, in rebuilding the, vo the wall. And let me read it again. Uh, let's go back to verse 8. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem, stir up trouble against us. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. So he not only prayed, but he took... Uh, uh, in a sense, military action to protect what they were doing. So as we think about uh, some principles, some ideas from Nehemiah, we see that from the beginning of the book and even here that prayer is a mighty weapon. It's a mighty uh, response to the, the task of, of sharing the gospel, of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, a second element uh, that uh, is revealed in Nehemiah that's true all the way through the Bible is uh, and not only is prayer as one of our tools, our weapons uh, in our spiritual warfare, but also in the advancement of our spiritual lives or of evangelism, of sharing the Word of God. Uh, the, the second element that's very uh, prevalent in the book of Nehemiah as well as Ezra, is uh, the Bible. In chapter 8 of Nehemiah, verse 5, and uh, referring to uh, the law of the Lord, uh, and Ezra was a teacher of the law, of the scriptures, uh, the book of the law of Moses, specifically, chapter 8, verse 2. But in verse 5 it says, uh, Ezra opened the book, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And he opened it, and the people all stood up. 
Ezra praised the Lord, the God of uh, the great God of all the people, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with a face to the ground. So Ezra the scribe, uh, uh, because many of the people had uh, lost their understanding really of the Hebrew language because they'd been in Babylon, uh, but he would uh, stand above the people on a platform with the Torah, with the law. He would read the law of Moses, and and, uh, it's suggested too that he would explain it to them. He would translate it uh, to the people. Uh, some of the Jews there had been had not left, had, had remained in Israel. So it was kind of a mixed group. But the whole point is <laughs> that the book of the law of Moses, the word of God, uh, the people had not heard uh, for decades. They had not heard the scriptures. They had not studied the law. They hadn't heard the voice of God. And again, in, uh, in evangelism, in communicating the gospel of our Lord and Savior in the day in which we live or in any culture in which we live, people need to hear the word of God. They need to hear the scripture. They need to hear, thus saith the Lord. They need to hear, as uh, we know, uh, our famous evangelist Billy Graham always saying, the Bible says, uh, because this is our uh, basis of authority, basis of truth. And uh, this is very prevalent throughout Ezra and Nehemiah that the scriptures were explained to the people. So two uh, very, very key elements in Nehemiah, you could say in terms of all of ministry, and we're going to apply it as we continue to develop our theology of evangelism. But even in this day, prayer, seeking God. And part of that prayer is uh, inter- intercession for others. Part of that prayer is, Lord, protect us. Uh, part of that prayer in Nehemiah is confession. We see the people uh, confessing their sins. Uh, we see uh, continual reforms. And, and these are based on two elements. The Word of God, uh, the Bible, the, the book of Moses being read and explained to the people, and uh, uh, the response then of the people. Uh, One, confession of their sins, and two, uh, the courage uh, to continue the task of God, which in this case for the book of Nehemiah was uh, to rebuild the wall. Uh, And in in the process of that, rebuilding the wall, (laughs) they're learning about God as revealed from Scripture. And they're also seeing the power of God as they unite together. And they're each assigned a task. They're each assigned a section of the wall. They each uh, work. And in their work, as they're working to rebuild this wall, uh, on the one hand, they're praying. On the other hand, uh, they they have their weapons. (laughs) They have their their work and their weapons and prayer. And uh, they are successful in completing the wall. And uh, once the wall is completed... uh, there is another element that Nehemiah uh, reveals to us, really, in the, in the working of God. Our God, the God revealed in Scripture, the Yahweh God is revealed to Moses uh, as he works with people, as they hear the word of God, as they respond to that in obedience, uh, and they began working together, uh, they, they completed the wall. And in the 12th chapter of the book of Nehemiah, we have the dedication of the wall. And um, it it was a great celebration in verse 27 of chapter 12. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they had lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. Uh, So there is a great, great celebration. And um, so as we think of God, think of the people of God, we think of the relationship together, that uh, obviously one of the outcomes of a relationship with God is celebration. It's celebration on the basis that work has been accomplished. 
uh, life has been done. It's been done well. Uh, the, the, the rebuilding of the city was phenomenal. And uh, uh, God loves people. <laughs> God has created us to be creative, to, to work. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, that uh, man is noble and man is created in the image and likeness of God because man works with God, <laughs> tending the garden with God. Work isn't something that is a punishment. Work is a privilege. Uh, work is an opportunity to be creative. Even as God created, we can use our hands, our minds, our skills, our imagination to create and so here this wall is built, rebuilt, in 50-some uh, days. The work is accomplished. Amazing. And then in chapter uh, 12 again, verse 43, it says, And on that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be could be heard far away. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. And again, here now we have an outcome of a people that uh, are delivered uh, not from slavery in Egypt, not from captivity in Babylon, but they're delivered from the, the, the people that are living around them. <laughs> the fear of the, the neighbor next door the fear of the everyday, and they accomplish the restoration of their city, a city that's going to contain many people, that there's going to be life and, and the growing of families and education and work and, and music and worship, uh, all of this together, the, the ordering of society, trade and travel and coming and going freely, uh, and, and the outcome is, is, is great, great joy, great, great rejoicing. It reminds me of what uh, Philip experienced in Acts chapter 8, and we'll look at it later uh, as we study this. But again, these, these elements we see throughout Scripture, and even at the altars and the sacrifice and the sweet aroma going up, pleasure. God uh, seeing the sacrifice of people, uh, Noah and his family celebrating, you know, after the flood. Uh, here we see uh, after the exile. Uh, we'll see this in Psalms as we go to another section of Scripture. But what, what is the outcome of salvation? And God redeeming us and, and the good news being preached, people getting to have their sins forgiven and knowing God. It is rejoicing. It, it is celebration. It is uh, lifting our, our hearts with great exuberance uh, about life. This is what God wants for his people. This is, makes God's heart happy as well as making our hearts happy. So we have taken a little time here in the book of Nehemiah to not only see, in a sense, the problem, the gates and the city were destroyed and they weren't rebuilt, that was a problem. Not just having God's presence at the temple and the people going up to the temple, but what about the homes? What about the places of commerce, of trade? Uh, what about schools? What about uh, civil government and, and the whole functioning of society? It wasn't working. And that wasn't pleasing to God nor to Nehemiah. And God had chosen Nehemiah to come, a man of that kind of experience and caliber of life, to lead the rebuilding of the walls and of the gates and of the city itself. Salvation, according to Psalm 130, and we'll get there soon in our study, it says that God, the God of the Bible, is a God who desires full redemption. And for Philip in the Acts chapter 8 is he went to Samaria and he preached the gospel. He preached Christ. There were miracles done. People came to faith in Jesus Christ. And it says in Acts 8, and great joy came to the city. So uh, as we think of evangelism, as we think of evangelists, you know, 
what's the outcome of our life and ministry? What's the outcome of the, the book of Nehemiah? As God restores, rebuilds, takes that which is torn down and people are not living there and they don't want to be there. They're you know, staying away from Jerusalem. Uh, rather, God would be there to, for them in worship, but also for them in the living of life, that it would be exuberant, that it would be praiseworthy, there would be joy in, in, in the homes, in people's hearts, in the whole city. So um, <clears throat> these are the elements that we find in the book of uh, Nehemiah. Let's review real quickly <laughs> that uh, some of the key elements that brought this were prayer, uh, confession, the Word of God, and uh, obedience to that as the people work together hearing the Word of God. And the outcome is great joy came to that city, the city of Jerusalem.